Hey guys and welcome to this video called 2555 years later Belshazzar celebrated Babylon fell and uh, the opening verse is Zechariah 2 7 deliver thyself O Zion that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon for thus saith the Lord of hosts after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye and of course that's talking about Israel so Babylon falls. Babylon fell around October time, 539 BC. Uh, and 2018 plus 539 to see where we are, it's 2557 years, uh, which we minus one <clears throat> for year zero. And that gives us 2556. But of course, this year is not finished. So 2555 years ago, around this time, uh, in October, November time on the Babylonian calendar was when Babylon fell. And if we read the histories uh, and the account by the Greek researcher Herodotus, um, that is the first, uh, the, the first historical study and the account of the fall of Babylon, which I'm going to go over because I think it's important that we read that. But I just wanted to, um, this is a slightly off topic, just some interesting names with regards to the two Jewish guys who are, who are dealing with a peace deal. First is obviously Jared Kushner. Jared means shall come down. And in Enoch, it says that uh, at the time of Jared, uh, which his name means shall come down, was when the, uh, the watchers came down. <clears throat> and then, of course, his surname is Kushner, which means the seller of fur coats. And um, in the Garden of Eden, as I'm sure we all know, God gave Adam and Eve fur coats. So that was the, the, um, the, for the, the, the covering of, of their sin. And that was obviously a prophecy of Jesus. So I just find it interesting that Kushner means the seller of fur coats. So it's like, it's, it's like um, in, the, in the commerce of actually selling fur coats, which could be associated with, uh, with, the, with sacrifice. And then the second is Jason Greenblatt. Jason means healer, and Greenblatt means green leaf. And in uh, in uh, Romans 11, it talks about uh, the branch, the natural branch, and the wild branch being <clears throat> being cut off, and uh, the natural branch being grafted back in. So I just wanted to share those two names with you. I thought they were very interesting as I as I go on to this um, presentation. So uh, Herodotus on, this, uh, on Cyrus's capture of Babylon, uh, there's a lot to go through, but I think it's important just that we understand that um, his account of the fall of Babylon is, is, uh, is perfect as far as the Bible is, is concerned. So Cyrus on his way to Babylon came to the banks of the Gynes, a stream which rising in the Massian mountains runs through the country of the Dardinians and empties itself into the, into the river Tigris. The Tigris, after receiving the Gynes, flows on by the city of Opus and discharges its water into the Erythrean Sea. So it's just describing the, the flow of the rivers. And when Cyrus reached the stream, which could only be passed in boats, that's the one that was protecting Babylon, one of the sacred white horses accompanying his march full of spirits and high metal walked into the water and tried to cross, but the current seized him and swept him along with it and drowned him in its depths. Cyrus, enraged at the insolence of the river, threatened to break its strength that in future even women should cross it easily without wetting their knees. Accordingly, he put off for a time his attack on Babylon, and dividing his army into two parts, he marked out by ropes 180 trenches on each side of the Gaians, leading off from it in all directions and setting his army to dig, some on one side of the river, some on the other, and he accomplished his threat by the aid of so great a number of hands, but not without losing thereby a whole summer season, so it takes him quite a long time. Having, however, thus wreaked his vengeance on the Gaians by dispersing through the 360 channels, Cyrus, with the first approach of the ensuing spring, marched forth towards Babylon. So he, he, he goes in to attack Babylon. The Babylonians, encamped without their walls, awaited his coming. A battle was fought at a short distance from the city in which the Babylonians were defeated. So the Babylonians were defeated outside of Babylon by Cyrus, the Persian king, whereupon they withdrew their defenses, and here they shut themselves up and made light of his siege, having laid in store of provisions for many years in the preparation against his attack. So the, so the Babylonians knew, because Cyrus had taken so many nations, 
that he was, he was going to come for them. So they stored up all this food. For when Sa they saw Cyrus conquering nation after nation, they were convinced that he would never stop and that, and that their turn would come at last. And of course it did. <clears throat> And it says Cyrus was now reduced to great perplexity because he was obviously locked out and there were, the walls of Babylon were massive. As time went by, he made no progress against the place. In this distress, either someone made a suggestion to him or he bethought himself a plan which he proceeded to, to put in execution. He placed a portion of his army at the point where the river enters the city and another body at the back of the place where it issues forth with the orders to march into town by the bed of the stream. And as soon as the water became shallow enough, he then withdrew off with the unwarlike portion of his host and made for the place where uh, Nato Chris notes, a legendary former queen, dug the basin of the river where he did exactly what she had done formerly. So obviously this had been done before. And he, he, he turned the Euphrates by a canal into the basin, which was then a marsh on which the river sank to such an extent that the natural bed of the stream became fordable. Hereupon the Persians who had been left for the purpose at Babylon by the riverside entered the stream, which had now sunk so as to reach about midway up a man's thigh. And thus they got into the town. Had the Babylonians seen and been apprised of what Cyrus was about, or had they noticed their danger, they would never have allowed the Persians to enter the city, but would have destroyed them utterly, for they would have made fast all the street gates, which gave access to the river, and mounting upon the walls both sides of the stream. So Babylon was very fortified, but there was a, a place where they thought that, that they could they could uh, they could leave because the the stream was so deep, and that's obviously where Cyrus came in. But as it was, the Persians came upon them by surprise and so took the city, owing to the vast size of the place. Babylon was massive. The inhabitants of the central parts and the res residents at Babylon declare long after the outer portions were taken knew nothing of what a chance, but as they were engaged in a festival, that's exactly what was happening with, um, with uh, Belshazzar, continued dancing and reveling until they learnt about the capture. Such then were the circumstances of the first taking of Babylon. So, Herodotus explains exactly the situation which is seen in, um, which is seen in, uh, in, in Daniel chapter 5, which is the, the, the account of Belshazzar. So now, here's where I just want to say, I'm not, I'm not against Donald Trump, and um, I, I, I don't want to offend anybody. I know that there are a lot of supporters of Donald Trump out there. Nevertheless, I have to, I have to speak the truth of what I see and how I see this. So I'm not against Donald Trump, but I am against Donald Trump dividing the land of Israel, and that's really what this presentation is about. And I hope that you would. Um, you would listen and uh, just just hear what I have to say, because uh, I see it in a different way as uh, as these these Trump prophecies have 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 accounted uh, for the Trump typology. So I'm going to go through this slide. I'm sure I'm going to get lots of uh, dislikes because a lot of people aren't going to like what I have to say. But um, I'm not doing this for popularity, and I'm not doing it for likes and subscriptions or for money. I'm doing this out of my labor of love, so I will, I will bear witness to the truth. So, Babylon had just been repelled by an attack by the Medo-Persians, that's Darius and Cyrus. And in the Hebrew writings, it is said that Belshazzar was fully aware that Israel were to be redeemed according to the prophecy of Jeremiah, but he calculated the years incorrectly. It says that Gemara explains, he, Belshazzar, calculated as follows, 45 years for Nebuchadnezzar, and 23 for evil Merodach, and two of his own, for a total of 70 years that had passed without redemption. He was therefore certain that Jeremiah's prophecy would no longer be fulfilled, and he therefore said, I will take out the vessels of the holy temple and use them. So it was because uh, Belshazzar believed that Jeremiah's prophecy was false, and uh, they had repelled this attack, that uh, he made a mockery and he called out uh, for the, uh, the temple vessels. That's why he called for them. And Belshazzar was in the second year of his reign when the writing on the wall happened. So if you if you look at Daniel chapter 7, you'll see that Daniel chapter 7 starts off and it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his, of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum. And 
in Daniel chapter chapter seven is the is the record of the night visions of the beasts that he sees. And he says that after this, I saw in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast. That's the final one. Dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue of the with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the four beasts that were before, were before it. And it had ten horns. So he's talking about ten horns. Right. So Daniel sees this vision of these beasts. And then in Daniel chapter 7, uh, verses 13, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then in verse 18, it says, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And in verse 22, it says, Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So that's that vision that Daniel has. And that vision has, has, is, very, uh, is very close to Revelation chapter 12. If you see Revelation 12, it says that the, that, uh, his man -child, the man child ruled with a rod of iron. So Daniel sees this vision one year in the first year of Belshazzar's, um, of Belshazzar's reign. It says in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. In the first year, we saw in the first year, the Revelation chapter 12 sign. Then it says here that Belshazzar was in the second year of his reign when the writing on the wall happened. And of course, Donald Trump is in his second year of reign as well. And Belshazzar assumed that because Babylon had repelled the first attack, that the prophecy was wrong. And so he called for the temple vessels as, as a mockery. And this was when the finger wrote on the wall and his loins were loosed and he called for Daniel and notice that Daniel wasn't part of the uh, the festival Daniel was was nowhere near there right he had to be called and it was at the 70 year period after Babylon falls that Daniel writes about Darius's reign if you look in Daniel 9 chapter 2 it says in the first year of his Darius's reign I Daniel understood by the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Belshazzar miscalculated um, the, uh, the 70 year prophecy and so he belittled Israel. And in Daniel 5.4 it says, They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. Their strength was in their military and their economy and they thought that nothing was going to happen to them because they, they thought that they were impenetrable. And wine is, uh, is referred to as different things in the Bible. It can be a metaphor. There's the wine of violence. Uh, there's the wine of the condemned in Amos 2.8. There's the wine of wrath in Revelation 14.8. 4, and then there's the wine of fornication. So it doesn't necessarily mean that um, according to the wine that they were drinking, that, um, that there's a literal fulfillment of wine, but it could just be the fornication of the world. And in Daniel 5.23 it says, Daniel says to Belshazzar, But thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels out of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. So it's not about the glorification of God. It's about the glorification of all the, the elements of the economy, if you will. And, and, uh, they, and they were so uh, proud in their strength and, uh, and in their wealth and in their riches. And in Daniel 5, uh, 26, it says, um, this is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, mene, tekel, a parson. That's what, it, that's what it wrote on the wall. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balance and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So because Belshazzar belittled Israel, that's when God divided the kingdom because Belshazzar thought that, that uh, Babylon was, was God's priority and that, uh, that the gods of Babylon were 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 more powerful than the God of Israel. So and he completely ignored what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. 
And in Isaiah, um, just looking at the uh, the scriptures that people actually say that, that Donald Trump is like Isaiah or Zacharias, it says in Isaiah 44, 28, that, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the holy temple, thy foundation shall be laid. And in Isaiah 45, verses 1, it says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, that was obviously Belshazzar, and open before him two levered gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives. And here's the most important part. Not for price or reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Not for price or reward. There's no negotiating. There was no, Israel has to, has to give half of, uh, half of their land away. Cyrus did what he did for no price or reward. And it's important to remember that Belshazzar was not against Daniel. He actually rewarded Daniel because Daniel interpreted the dream. But the Cyrus typology is talking about Christ being a shepherd to, for, the, uh, for the Jewish people. And if this is attributed to Donald Trump, then how can it also be attributed to Christ? Christ will subdue nations. Russia, Iran, China and North Korea are examples of Donald Trump not subduing nations. They are still defiant and they are still very, very dangerous. And China and, uh, and Russia are preparing for war. And that is not a war that I want to be a part of. If, uh, if Donald Trump is going to subdue those nations, then uh, I definitely don't want to be here when that happens because that's World War Three and that's the tribulation. And Cyrus destroyed all the nations that he, that he came against before he, he conquered Babylon. So it was the whole, the whole world, as far as the, then was concerned, was already conquered and then Babylon was, uh, was conquered. So it wasn't, it wasn't in a peacetime uh, as we are, we are in now. Generally speaking, this world is in in, in a peace time. And the Cyrus prophecy is talking about the new temple's uh, foundations being laid and the building of the city of Jerusalem for no price or reward. There's no negotiating with the worshippers of Baal or the Amalekites or the Palestinians who, um, who are a fictitious lie. They're a propaganda tool which the world has uh, swallowed hook, line and sinker and it's going to bring the judgment of God and they recognize a Palestinian state on God's land. Donald Trump is negotiating a deal which gifts the land of Israel to an Islamic fabrication called Palestine. Belshazzar was at the end of a kingdom's downfall. Cyrus was at the beginning of a kingdom's reign. Cyrus is a type of Christ. Cyrus is Christ coming back and setting up the millennial kingdom. Belshazzar was at the end of a kingdom's downfall and belittled Israel. And Belshazzar did not recognize the God of Israel and dealt lightly with Israel for his own glory. Whereas Cyrus openly decreed in Ezra 1.3, the Lord God of Israel, he is God, which is in Jerusalem. He declared the God of Israel as God. No other God. He is the God. So Babylon the Great. Uh, America is head of Babylon and uh, Babylon is the whole world. So America is the head of, is the head nation of Babylon. Ignoring what Trump and his administration is doing with Israel in preference to what he is doing with the economy in the US is the same as those who drank with Belshazzar in Babylon while he and they ignored the prophetic word of God. At the very climax of Belshazzar celebrating that Babylon had won a battle against their enemies, things changed very quickly because he dealt lightly with God's prophetic word regarding Israel. And are we about to see exactly the same prophetic pattern next month if the Republicans win the primaries? Will the peace deal of the century that recognizes a Palestinian state on God's land of Israel be akin to the temple vessels being brought out to drink? So I think next month we're going to see a red wave, but I don't think that it's a very good thing to put your uh, trust in man, the very central verse of the Bible says that uh, it is better to trust in the Lord than to trust in man. So this is how I see this going next month. As you guys know, uh, the end of the Revelation chapter 12 sign is going gonna, is gonna to happen next month. That's what I believe. I could be wrong. Only time will tell. And here we have a, a if this occurs, a, a perfect prophetic pattern of what happened in Babylon 
exactly 2,555 years ago around this time. I'm hoping that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ comes. I'm hoping to be in paradise. I'm hoping to set my eyes and behold uh, the God of the universe. I can't wait to see Jesus. Um, I, I encourage all people to come out of the world. Do not be uh, rooted with your hearts in politics because what do politics matter in a world that is about to be destroyed? I understand that, uh, that uh, patriotism is something which, uh, which, which, is, which is a natural thing that comes to us. It's our territory. But nevertheless, we are pilgrims passing through this world. We are passing through and the King of Kings is coming. We need to be focused on Him. We need to avoid all the vitriol and the, and the spite and the vicious hatred which is going on between blue and red in that country. Barack Obama came along and he divided black and white, men and women, straight and gay, Muslims and Christians, and the division has not stopped. The division has continued in America, and the division is now between the two big, big parties of blue and red. A kingdom divided cannot stand, and um, the things that I see, I see Christians posting almost rapidly about Donald Trump, about uh, the Republican Party and the things which are going on there. We are not we are not called to be a part of the world. We'll warn the people that the end is coming. Not that the Republican Party is going to win. Warn the people that Jesus Christ is just about to arrive. Anybody, anybody, any man that exists on this earth that is preaching or proclaiming prosperity is a false preacher. Anybody saying that there's not destruction coming is a false preacher preacher. He's, he's a, he is a false prophet, whether he believes in God or not. If he is declaring peace, he is, he is false. The judgment of God is coming. The destruction of God is coming. And Christians need to focus on Jesus Christ arriving and warning the world what is about to happen to it.